and uh, and I also thank for uh, for Dean Labus and my old friend uh, Jan Stempel, Professor Stempel, uh, for for the greeting here. I am most grateful for this. The triumvirate of the three institutions, the Artist Research Institute of the Academy of Sciences, uh, the, uh, the Architecture Faculty of Technical University, and the Jaroslav Fragnell Gallery for you know, joining forces in, in inviting me. Uh, as uh, Professor Kratofil also men already mentioned, you know, my research on Center Europe, of course, brings me again and again to Prague, uh, but uh, it is also thanks to him that, that that I could see this time again a lot of new stuff that was, that I was not uh, familiar with before. So it's great to be here. And indeed, uh, my lecture is uh, basically about materiality in architecture. I will bring also many contemporary examples, uh, uh, mainly Swiss examples, I, I, I admit also. And, uh, and of course, that is also, you know, the, I, I try to make a, a few thoughts about the underlying big theme, which is uh, truth uh, in general, truth in architecture, which is, uh, again, a very difficult issue, I guess, and, and I, am not, uh, I am not saying that I am going to, to answer uh, this, this, uh, this, this problematic uh, with this lecture. But at least, you know, I tried to, uh, to shed some light about how the issue of truth was used more as a kind of a metaphor of approaching architectural problems. But can we speak at all of truth of architecture? Architects arguing uh, for the correctness of their convictions, aesthetic or social, uh, use frequently claims for truth. Sometimes uh, truth refers uh, to the use, as buildings always, you know, allow certain functions and disallow others. Sometimes uh, to meaning, sometimes to experience. From the early 20th century on, the peasant house, the vernacular hut, uh, was considered as the epitome of truthful architecture. In a, in a kind of a almost naive, uh, undistorted approach toward building. In the 1920s, the transparency of, of the glass became associated with truthfulness. Here I just remind you, uh, in this case, uh, uh, Mies van der Rohe quoting uh, Thomas uh, Aquinas, Pulchritudo est splendor veritatis, beauty is the splendor of truth, and he was consciously or otherwise referring here uh, to uh, the uh, scholastic aesthetics of Plotin and the Neoplatonists. Accordingly, the opulent marble cladding, uh, or the marble panels rather, in the German pavilion at the Universal Exposition in Barcelona, glow with the shine of Byzantine basilicas. The example is here, uh, Ravenna. But like always, it is the authority of the architect that wants you to accept such claims for truth. They also belong to the mythology of modern architecture. Nowadays, as revelations about the, let's say, ethical shortcomings of architects like Adolf Loos or, uh, or Le Corbusier uh, tickle the public interest, truth is also connected to the personal integrity, uh, to the authenticity of the architect. Is it then easier to speak about uh, non-truth in architecture? Of course, on the level of, of actual buildings, it is impossible to speak about architectural lies. But we can say that uh, trompe l'oeil decorations, like in this case, painted doors or domes are deceptions. But still, the built body of architecture is sound, and the assembly of materials attempts no deception, only the painted decoration. But how about architectural fictions, representations of buildings that doesn't exist? Architects are increasingly interested uh, in working with artists who are assembling images by collaging parts of real buildings uh, with digital means, like uh, Philip Scherer and Roger Boltzhauser. Scherer 
uh, studied, uh, it is on the right hand side, studied architecture in Lausanne, and after working in the office of uh, Herzog and Demeron, in 2007 he started to make what he calls Bilderbauten, image buildings. These buildings uh, uh, have uh, compact forms, but they are, of course, non existing. They are collages made by using the same kind of digital rendering technology that made the uh, visual representations of the office of Herzog und Dömeron uh, so appealing. Scherer's images could be regarded as a critique of spectacular architectural renderings, but in this lecture I am more interested in the obvious uh, tension between reality and fiction, of truth and lie, if you want. The way uh, Scherer presents his, his Bilderbauten uh, reminds me very much of the uh, typological uh, tables of uh, Bernd and Hilla Becher, uh, the German photographers of new objectivity, a very sober, seemingly analytical approach. An early master of this lineage uh, was uh, Karl Losfeld, whose photographs of plants from the 1920s inspired Scherer to create his own uh, Naturmord uh, series on the right-hand side, computer-generated forms whose surface is laced with an ornamentation, but somehow appear more as a decorative layer, arbitrary, not shaped by the same kind of organic force than the fine veins of the leaves. And it is here uh, where lie turns somehow into truth. The strange world of these totally fictional objects captured the attention of the architect uh, Roger Boltzhauser, who uh, was teaching assistant in the studio of Peter Merkley, the Swiss architect in Zurich. Merkley's interest in raw materiality is, is obvious, and he was always critical of the polished perfection of, of, of Swiss architecture in general. So he was you know, very consciously working uh, with, with, uh, with details that were uh, very raw, imperfect, and, and uh, there was a big debate about this, because architects like uh, Oljati and so on, they insisted that, that after you know, removing the, the, the shuttering, removing the, the formwork of the concrete, it must be perfect, he started to sue uh, you know, uh, uh, building companies that, that couldn't achieve, achieve this kind of perfection. And Merkley was very critical uh, of this kind of uh, understanding and approach. The two, Scherer, uh, the architect, artist of the Bilderbauten, and Roger Boltzhauser, who is working with kind of new ecological materials like rammed earth, they started to, to cooperate, and they cooperated indeed in designing uh, the, uh, the Oceaneum project, an aquarium in the Basel Zoo. They imagined the volume as a piece cut from a sedimented earthen mass. So you see here on the left-hand side the computer rendering, and on the right-hand side, uh, a, a digital work uh, by, by Scherer uh, that was inspired uh, by, by such photographs, like in this case, Bas Prinzen, uh, a photograph uh, of uh, Dendera in, in Egypt. Unfortunately, uh, the Oceanum project was rejected, uh, like always in Switzerland, the local population had to vote, and they thought that an aquarium nowadays, you know, bringing sea animals into the city is, is a no-go, so to see. So uh, it's not going to be built as it stands, at least today. But again, you see already that uh, Herzog de Meron was also interested in, in this kind of raw effect of the, of the earth. Uh, the facade of the Schaulager of the Lawrence Foundation in Basel, uh, finished in 2003. Uh, here, Herzog and Dümeron already used the material of the site, the gravel uh, taken from the construction pit. The seemingly porous, mud-colored facades of Jurassic limestone 
uh, excavated from the side, combined with the deep uh, crevices of the, of the window strips, uh, create a, a kind of a geological landscape. The interest in material transformation is obvious. The interest in the alchemy and, and sensual presence of raw matter, uh, I think, uh, interest a lot of uh, young architects. Alchemy as a transubstantiation, transformation of material is a theme in art. Uh, since, uh, at least since Christianity. This is a medieval painting on the left uh, from a church in Porto, in, in, in Portugal. Uh, but they are much more recent examples for, for kind of this transformation of material, like wine and blood in this case, of course. Uh, an interesting example and how it affected architecture is the case of the French avant-garde artist Yves Klein. In February 1961, Yves Klein undertook a pilgrimage uh, to the small Umbrian town of Kasia near Perugia in order to present a votive offering to Santa Rita uh, di Kasia, the patron saint of his family. The offering was placed, as you see it on the bottom of the right-hand side, in a clear plastic box. In the three upper compartments, uh, he put uh, ultramarine and pink colored pigments and gold leaf. Uh, and the lower one, uh, tiny gold bars on a layer of ultramarine pigment. A folded piece of paper was placed uh, in this uh, compartment between the two, in which uh, Klein prayed for success, beauty, and eternal life uh, for his work. Klein had previously participated in the exhibition Vision in Motion in Antwerp and demanded pure gold as a payment for his work. The buyer had to ceremoniously burn the invoice for the purchased immaterial uh, zone, which indicated the weight of the corresponding gold. Thereupon, that is what you see on the photograph, uh, if Klein uh, if Klein uh, threw half of the gold into the sea or a river in the presence of experts as, as witnesses, and he placed the other half in the votive casket. The idea here is the transmutability of, uh, of immateriality and materiality. The depth uh, that one can never buy with money, but only with gold, is the blue depth of the sea. And Herzog and de Meuron very consciously chose the ultramarine blue of Yves Klein as the color of the huge triangle of the Barcelona Forum, built uh, 2004, uh, which stands at the very point where the big uh, Avenida Diagonal in Barcelona uh, meets uh, the Mediterranean shoreline. This is a surface where the earth and haptic and, uh, and such weight that the blue sprayed concrete volume with its glazed cracks floats surreally over the golden and silver reflections and, and highlights its uh, hollowed out base. A similar symbiosis of, of architects and artists uh, on the verge of truth and fiction is the cooperation between the Belgian architect uh, Jan de Wilder of the office de Wilder Wink Taille and uh, the Belgian artist Philippe Dujardin. The name of the game here is, is bricolage, a notion developed by, by the structural, structuralist ethnologist uh, uh, Claude Levi Strauss to describe the workings of the so called savage mind. As Dujardin, and this is of course the kind of almost a typical uh, Belgian uh, site, you know, the city with this kind of, of, of firewalls out of brick and, 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 and asbestos sheets. Uh, but, uh, but in this case, of course, this is again a fiction. This is uh, collaged out of, of other images. And uh, as Dujardin assembles his quasi-architectural images, uh, uh, the divider uh, puts his own houses uh, together. But he leaves, uh, as you see, scaffolding struts uh, in the shell of the existing building. It is the raw materiality of the uh, construction site 
that he associates, in the sense, with truth, with a certain, at least with a certain closeness to reality. A quality that we miss in the Polish world of customer culture. You see here two examples. The one is a store, the, the Twiggy store in, in Ghent, uh, which is, you know, he removed part of the existing building, and in that way we have this, this very, very interesting and very surreal side uh, of, a, of a space uh, that we can hardly, you know, really judge what is, uh, what is reality, what is fiction, what is a window, and, 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 uh, and there is a kind of a dizzying, uh, uh, reality that, that, that is uh, in front of our eyes. But also other architects work very consciously with this kind of contrast. Uh, the uh, three rough, uh, damaged, seemingly damaged brick pillars in the main courtyard of Eduardo Soto de Mora's laboratory building on the Novartis campus in, uh, in Basel, Switzerland. It was built in 2012. And the damage uh, to the pillars is, of course, intentional. Uh, they invited the Portuguese artist uh, uh, Pedro Cabrita Reis uh, to chip off the outer skin, the skin of the brick stele to make the inner structure of the material appear. The inner structure may remind us of, uh, of men or rather uh, female-made fabric. I have here kind of a comparison between a Bauhaus textile and the surface of, uh, of the brick uh, stele. Uh, and uh, the artwork shatters the aseptic atmosphere of the perfectly executed laboratory building and renders the physical work involved in the production process visible. At the same time, the layered structure of the big masonry is also a reference to the geological fabric of the earth. Just remember uh, the photograph of, of uh, Bas Prinsen from, from Dendera. This ambiguity, however, seemed to vanish in the image of the ruin where transitoriness unites uh, the geological and the man-made. The interaction between the dirty realism of the brick stele and the perfect finish of the building is telling us something about the messy truth of the underlying labor. In architecture, even the very latest uh, mechanical production processes seem unable to produce more than apparently archaic uh, amorphous masses of matter. It is exemplified by the uh, products of the remote material deposition uh, process developed by Gramatio Kohler architects. A computer controlled uh, and a shooting device hurls uh, clay projectiles toward predetermined spatial positions that the projectiles should uh, kind of heap up to create a wall. The structure is con uh, continually measured as it rises and the control mechanism is adapted accordingly. In this way, digital technologies are paradoxically uh, uh, result in a primary, very iconoclastic, very ontological, let's say, materiality. Launching devices transfer materials uh, to a pile which appears excessively thrown together despite the precision of the, of the uh, shooting technology. But let's start uh, at the beginning, uh, meaning uh, the discourse on truth in architecture. Truth is used to mean, it is, as I mentioned in the introduction, it is not the only uh, possible interpretation of truth in architecture, but in general, in most of the uh, works on architecture that, that addresses the issue of truth, truth is used to mean a certain converg convergence uh, between how something appears and what something really is. So that appearance shows uh, what it is without the, the disassembling, uh, dissembling or hiding. Truth as an authenticity or genuineness. It is this sense of truth that has most often been taken to be involved in architectural discourse. The birth of the idea of truth uh, to materials in architecture is associated with the name of the Venetian Franciscan priest, Carlo Lodoli. Lodoli wanted to, uh, he lived in the uh, 
last decade of the 17th and the first half of the, of the 18th century. He wanted to return architecture to its true fundamentals, as it were. Representation, representation is a, a key word in his theory. Nothing should be visible in architecture that fails to correspond with the truth. He criticized buildings that are, quote, built of stone and appear to be wood, like the Greek temples. And he asked, why should stone not be stone, wood not be wood? Why shouldn't everything be that which it is and not something else? Nothing is more vulgar than striving to ensure that a material appears not to be itself, but something different. This is a constant masquerade, a permanent deception. Only if form, construction, and decoration are derived from the, quote, the nature and essence of the material, can one build in an architecturally rational manner. Even his friends describes Lodoli's demand as terrible. Because his radical rationalism would have undermined the authority of Vitruvius by showing that he violated the doctrine of truth to materials with his notion of the timber origins of the Greek temple. Lodoli's linking of truth and the visibility of building materials meant that reason and architectural morality had finally become inseparable from the question of the relationship between structure and surface. Lodoli's argument uh, was developed further by the English architect Augustus Welby Pugin. In his book, True Principles, that was published in uh, 1841, uh, Pugin sharply attacked the dishonesty of the architecture of the time. The use and treatment of structural elements such as beams in classicist architecture reveal the origin of the model in timber architecture. Again, the same, you know, the same critique that we just heard. And uh, medieval Gothic, on the other hand, uses stone in line with its properties. Pugin criticized plaster as an expression of falsehood and of the moral decay of his time. And in his book, Contrast, which is probably the first book that, that uses good and bad examples, comparing them, he's showing on one hand, you see it on the, on the right hand side, a small picture, you know, in general, uh, the moral decay uh, in the, uh, on the land. You know, earlier, you know, when the church took care of the poor, and then today, meaning his time, when they are in prison if they cannot pay uh, their debts. And this is the same kind of, of moral decay that he finds also in architecture. Uh, the middle image on the right hand side, you know, this kind of, of, uh, of false Gothic decoration, which is not just pasted over the surface and the real, you know, uh, uh, carved uh, stonework. So the one is not, not much more than, uh, than, than uh, wallpaper architecture and the other is the real craftsmanship uh, in the sense of the truth to materials. The most influential representative of truth to materials was probably John Ruskin, uh, the English estate, who in his uh, The Seven Lamps of Architecture, published 1849, uh, particularly in the chapter The Lamp of Truth, criticized all forms of what he called architectural deceits. Uh, polychrome, labor-intensive brick architecture appeared to Ruskin, who regarded the craftsman's satisfaction in his work as one of the main criteria of good architecture. This was why he strictly rejected the painstaking mechanical imitation of Gothic. The architecture that he propagated in his books and lectures appeared coarse, and even very early they already started in the English discourse to use the word ugly in a, in a positive sense. You know, the ugliness of, of Butterfield, for instance, was a, uh, was a, a notion used by, by, by Summerson, or very often uh, architectures of the Smithsons were also described as, by themselves also as ugly. Ugly in the sense of a rough, a rough materiality that is truthful in difference to, to other kinds of architecture plantings. This is, by the way, uh, the house for William Morris, uh, designed by, by Philip Webb. 
very much in the sense of, of this kind of uh, uh, truth to architecture discourse. Also, uh, of course, Ruskin, and not only Ruskin, had a big impact on, in North America, developing a, an architecture was seen as, as truly American, influenced by the, by the, by the surrounding nature. And uh, this kind of fascination with nature and the link between nature and the political and cultural identity of the young nation was formulated in the transcendentalism of, uh, of uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson and also absorbed the views of, of Ruskin. The architecture of Henry Hobson Richardson that you see here in, in, uh, on the slide combines elements of the picturesque, such as irregularity, contrast, and color with, with, uh, with material effects. It is very interesting, though, uh, that despite the overall rejection of coverings and deceits, the textile-like effect of stone and brick facades was, was appreciated and recognized. Ruskin wrote in this already, uh, in his famous The Stones of Venice, about wall veils, and this is an illustration from the Stone of Venice. This is what he understood by wall veils, kind of a textile-like effect of a, of a colorful uh, brick facade. He was also, of course, very careful to, to, to make such uh, watercolors and drawings, showing you know, every detail of the, of the material effect of a, uh, of a facade. And uh, also, still in the United States, uh, the smaller bank buildings uh, which Louis Sullivan built in the rural centers of the American Midwest, in Minnesota, in Iowa, and, and Ohio, are framed by shiny strips of, uh, of glazed terracotta. And Sullivan consciously sought the effect of textile surfaces. I quote from his description, description a texture with a nap-like effect suggesting somewhat an Anatolian rug, a texture giving innumerable highlights and shadows, and a moss-like appearance. Thus, the rough brick became really a fine brick and brought with it new suggestions of use and beauty. And along these lines, you know, looking at the surface, although uh, obviously still very much you know, reflecting this, this truth to materials discourse, but the textile metaphor is getting more and more important. Frank Lloyd Wright, who regarded himself as Sullivan's heir, used the so-called textile block system, that was his term, for his Californian buildings. Here, masonry is constructed from prefabricated light concrete blocks into which reinforcing iron bars were inserted in situ. The appropriate choice of, uh, of casting molds created an ornamental fabric-like effect. And, and Wright uh, uh, wrote even in, in, uh, in one of his numerous texts that all these previous architects, Palladio and so on, they were sculptors. And here I am, the weaver. And what is uh, obviously a reference again in this interest in, in, in textile-like effects. So it is time now to come back uh, to the origins of, of this theory that was well known in the United States. Exactly, you know, in the office of, uh, of, of Sullivan, uh, the work of, uh, of the German architect, architectural theorist, uh, were studied, and even they started to translate it uh, into English, and this translation never appeared in its entirety, only, only uh, some fragments in, uh, in American uh, reviews of architecture. So a few words about uh, Gottfried Semper, who is very much behind this all, what I call here, the principle of, 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 of cladding, or probably would be better to speak about a principle of dressing, which again has this double meaning, meaning in English, dressing as, uh, as the cloth and dressing as cladding a building with a, with a material. Bekleidungstheory is the German word, a theory of cladding that was developed in the 19th century by Semper as part of his comprehensive theory of, uh, of architecture and design. He was one of the most frequent visitors uh, in the uh, of the exhibition of the works of industry of all nations in the Crystal Palace in London, 1851. Uh, 
the end there, the reconstruction, you see this on the right hand side, of a fisherman's, uh, uh, of a fisherman's hut uh, from the island of Trinidad, offered him a confirmation of his system of the four elements of architecture. He saw that in this uh, small building, that is not just a fictional one like Logis primitive hut, but an, an ethnographical artifact exhibited inside the, uh, the uh, Crystal Palace. You see uh, the basic uh, four elements of all architecture. Uh, the, the hearth uh, as the center point with the fire, the raised earth as a terrace surrounded by posts, the column-supported roof, and the woven enclosure as a spatial uh, termination of the building. Semper distinguished uh, four primitive techniques that are connected to these four basic elements of the house. Uh, and these are the following ones. The textiles, obviously, as you see, the textile connect uh, with, the, with the wall. The ceramics which is, of course, the, with the fire, related to the fire in the center, uh, using clay and so on. Tectonics, which is the use of, uh, of rigid uh, uh, stick-like elements for building the roof. And stereotomy, which is the layering, the piling up of heavy stones to build the terrace. Sampers systematization of the four elements, which still, you know, tickle the imagination of architects. So this model that you see on the right-hand side was just recently built by the Swiss architecture office by, uh, of, of uh, Burkhalter and Sumi. Uh, it is interesting also because of this reversal of, 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 of causality, which can be traced back to his theory of Stoffwechsel. Although each architect technology is connected uh, to a material out of which it was born, like tectonics and timber, as I mentioned. The technical forms uh, later became estranged uh, from the origins as soon as they come into contact with new materials and technologies in a new environment. Forms that rooted in the way in which material was processed are transformed into other materials. So one, uh, one material can slip into the traditional form of the other. It is almost a kind of a, a play, a theatrical play of imitation, of, 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 of similitudes. Semper discusses uh, numerous interesting examples of, of, of material transformation in connection with the four basic techniques. He describes, for instance, uh, such Phrygian tombs, uh, that of Midas, as a colossal tapestry walls hewn in rock which were once stuccoed and richly adorned with paint and gilding. The shift from woven fabric to a carved stone facade, the transformation of a natural rock into a monument and artifact, reflects the transformation of nature by human labor, a creative destruction in a sense. According to Semper, the, the original materiality must be annihilated, destroyed, in order to be imbued by memory and to become a meaningful object that in turn transforms society. No wonder that Semper's contemporary Karl Marx employed the term Stoffwechsel to describe the interaction between humans and nature. In this material change of the natural environment, social relations are involved, and as a result, both nature and society will be transformed. The newly produced entities reflect the historic processes of their making. Stoffwechsel has a trajectory, a time arrow, let's say. Semper elevated the theory of material transformation to the central element of his practical aesthetic, as he called it. Uh, the German word Stoffwechsel, uh, the, the exact English translation is uh, metabolism, but metabolism means something different in architectural history. The German word implies circulation, exchange, and transformation. The chemists uh, Justus Liebig and, and Jakob Moleschott, a colleague of Sampers in Zurich, uh, uh, who first coined it, used it to describe material exchanges in the human and animal body and in the soil, between organisms and the environment. 
addressing uh, problems of, of sustainability even. As material circulates, it enters networks uh, that produce new assemblages. According to Semper, uh, the first of the two of the four elements is textile. But before I go there, I still show it because I think it is a rather telling example of this whole issue of, of material transformation. You see, you know, the original uh, triumphal arch in Rome uh, that in Semper's understanding is already a transformation of the uh, improvised wooden scaffolding that was erected to celebrate the victory of an army and for their, you know, return to the city. It was built of improvised in wood, wood and it was decorated by garlands, uh, by, with shields that were taken from the enemy and so on. And in order to commemorate this event, they rebuilt this original, rather kind of uh, uh, barbarian looking object uh, into stone, into marble, and creating therefore an artwork that is able you know, to keep the memory of this victory alive. And then you see the, the new stages of this transformation, the triumphal arch, uh, Semper's own uh, museum building in Dresden, Germany, as it is now uh, a, a triumphal entry into, from the city into the Zwinger. And uh, finally, which it is, I would always, almost use the word, reduced to a, just a, a, a layer of paint which was part of the critique, you know, against Semper's theory, that the, the, ultimate, the ultimate step in this chain of transformation is to transform it into a painting, which is the decoration for the aula of our university in Zurich that was designed by Semper. But textile is the first step, so to see. The textile is on one hand for the protection of the human body, uh, working with uh, materials that are pliable, tough, highly resistant to tearing of great absolute strength. I quoted here Semper. And that was the original art, given that all other technical arts borrowed their types and symbols from textiles. The start of the textile is the knot, you know, the knoten, uh, where a certain necessity uh, to, to strengthen uh, two threads of fiber uh, becomes a form. The three miles of the labyrinth, if, if you want, but certainly a, a form that reflects the spatial movement of the hand when making a knot. And the rhythmical repetition of the knot results in, in ornaments. So you see here uh, some illustrations, or at least one plate, from Semper's their steel, when he is showing uh, a ceiling uh, where the textile origin is again reflected in the color treatment and the ornamentation. Semper's own architecture, it is very much still a 19th century historicist architecture, but the north facade of, of uh, of the ETH or university where unfortunately the architecture has been expelled. Uh, but in any case, it is again covered with a, a very much kind of textile-like and fine graffito uh, decoration. In the beginning was dressing. This concise sentence by Adolf Loos, published on the 4th September uh, 1898 in the newspaper Neue Freie Presse, must have appeared to his readers like opening a new history of the creation of architecture. At first glance, it may appear uh, surprising that Loos, a very sharp-toned uh, critique of the superfluous in architecture, appropriated uh, Semper's theory of dressing. The human being uh, seeks protection from weather, which explains why the covering is the oldest architectural detail, which was originally made out of animal skins or textile products, writes Lowe's. The textile walls require a structural frame to hold them in the correct place. To invent this frame is the architect's second task. So the tectonic, so to see, is only the second step. 
and first comes the definition of the surface because of it, because of it of its let's say you know, uh, sensual effects. Hence, uh, the principle of, of dressing means beginning with the space as the content of architecture, and space is defined by its, uh, uh, by its surfaces. The principle of dressing sought to focus attention not on ornament, but on that layer in the order of things with architecture spreads out between the outside world and the skin, a texture produced by human intelligence and work, which gives pleasure both to the eyes and the hands. Loos sees the coherence of a work in the ethical relationship between inside and outside, which includes the question of clothing. And today, which is the right-hand slide, the fashion designer Albert Kremler uh, refers to Adolf Loos uh, when designing clothes. I quote him, I have to feel the fabric before I make drawings. Just like Loos had to choose between lemon and cherry wood, walnut and mahogany. This differentiation in the use of materials connects me with Loos. Loos's greatness has to do with sensual qualities up to his own dressing. But of course, uh, before uh, the, uh, the house Müller was built, uh, we have already numerous uh, beautiful examples of, uh, of this transformation. Uh, the uh, Viennese architect Otto Wagner, who was, of course, the master of, of, of many Czech architects, as you know, uh, started his work with, uh, I just remember, you know, this kind of the triumphal arch uh, story. Started uh, to, to build a festive structure, so improvised and, and, and temporary ones, uh, to big celebrations. Uh, the, uh, the entry of a princess into Vienna. And then in his later work, you know, this kind of festive tents uh, uh, became, uh, uh, became uh, realized of, of solid materials, like uh, the so-called Hof Pavilion, the court pavilion of the urban railway system in Vienna, kind of like a big tent hovering over, uh, the, uh, over the rails of the, uh, of, uh, of the train. And also the interior imitates uh, the interior of a, of a tent. The, uh, the apartment house known as Majolica House, built in the last years of the uh, 19th century, uh, was very early already compared uh, to uh, a tapestry. Partly because, of course, the richest part, the heaviest part of the ornamentation is uh, under the cornice, and it becomes lighter and lighter that we move down. So we really have the impression that we, we have to do here with, with an oriental rug that is hanging uh, from these hooks that have the form of, of, of lion's heads. And uh, the windows are just holes that are cut into this tapestry. So no wonder that uh, uh, Hans Hollein was inspired by this idea when he was asked to design the, the exhibition building for, uh, for a large exhibition of Turks in Vienna, and then he decided to cover uh, the whole building with a tent-like structure. What is interesting to me is this kind of uh, very interesting relationship between another a railway station uh, by Otto Wagner and, uh, his, and, and Hans Hollein's uh, big exhibition tent, sketch made, sketch made uh, by him. And of course, an interesting example of, of truth and untruth, Otto Wagner's uh, post uh, office savings bank in Vienna, which has this uh, marble cladding, and, and you see this very new decoration, very modern decoration, which is not really a decoration. These are the fixing bolts uh, for the very thin uh, marble plates. And Otto Wagner was very proud, saying that uh, modern technology allows us not to use anymore this kind of time and material wasting technology of the big kind of uh, stone cladding plates. But we have uh, this uh, precisely cut machine cut marble sheets that are so fine that, that, uh, that we don't need anymore this heavy scaffolding uh, to, to place them on the facade. 
but again uh, to, to show uh, that it is a cladding. He, he shows again uh, the, uh, the fixing bolts. And of course, on one hand, uh, if you want, it reminds us of a, of a, of a treasure chest, uh, a, a safe uh, that shows that your money is well uh, kept there, or, uh, but, uh, or the new kind of industrial aesthetics of the time, uh, the bolts uh, that are well known, of course, in the iron architecture that Otto Wagner was also working with. In any case, you know, if, uh, if dressing is a lie, that is certainly a true lie that shows uh, the, the fixed character of the cladding, the, the, the hanging character of the cladding. Some other examples that I will pass probably shortly, they are quite well known. Uh, an early and very beautiful example, I think, by the Otto Wagner uh, co-worker, colleague, uh, Max Fabiani, an, an architect from the Karst region, uh, the Slovenian-Italian border today. And he built this apartment and, and uh, house with a, uh, with a furniture store uh, on the ground floor. Uh, and it is clad uh, with, uh, uh, with, shiny, with shiny ceramic dyes from the Zsolnai factory in, in Hungary. Uh, and it is uh, certainly, again, uh, a reference uh, to, if you want, to, to, the, to the Orient, but first, of course, first comes Venice, where the Orient is kind of filtered and, and transmitted. Uh, the Palazzo Ducale, a very similar kind of, of textile facade that again seemed to hover, you know, like a veil over the lagoon. Joseph Plechnik, whom I don't have to introduce here, but I still want to mention the, the uh, famous Zachel House in, in Vienna, a very early work, uh, well, that quotes the formal language of, of textile. Indeed, almost one can, uh, in difference uh, to uh, the uh, Postparka in Vienna, the fixing is here with this kind of, uh, uh, of granite profiles uh, that uh, run uh, and cover the edges of the of the granite of the polished granite uh, uh, cladding, and uh, and they are kind of anchored in the masonry. The wall is made of masonry, of course, and that is a kind of a, a curtain wall in the real sense of the word. And the curtainness of the curtain is even accentuated by by using this kind of trottles, which is indeed a, a very much textile-like feature of the house and makes it appear quite light. Again, a local example by, by Plechnik here from Prague, uh, the Church of the Most Sacred uh, Heart of Our Lord uh, that is very clearly divided uh, by a lower part with this kind of heavy and protective coat and the other one that has a much more lighter, white but folded appearance to it. It has different interpretations. I don't want to uh, go into it, but if you start along the lines of, of this kind of argument, this issue of, of the transformation of materials and, and the transfer of forms, I think uh, you can really you know, uh, approach uh, the, uh, the meaning of this, of this building uh, quite easily. And now, again, the issue of material truth. This whole kind, uh, this whole aesthetic of dressing was certainly you know, attacked by, by many architects uh, of, the, of the modern. Uh, already contemporaries, like the lesser known Rudolf Rettenbacher, who wrote a book about tectonic, uh, wrote that, that uh, you know, tectonic doesn't need these kind of covers. So this whole issue of Truth as, as unveiling, demasking, uh, the, the, the nakedness of, of, of the architecture forms, free of any cladding, uh, became an almost a dogma in, in modern architecture. And Siegfried Gideon, uh, who wrote uh, this book that you see on the left hand side, Building in France, Building in Iron, Building in Ferro Concrete, it was published in 1928. Uh, this uh, main theoretician and organizer of the international modern associated 
modern architecture with the truth to materials, with the scientifically provable truth, let's say. Uh, the molecular properties of iron, and science had to study the specific laws, and constructions had to find a formative process that differed from the, from the treatment of wood. So you see here on the right hand side again an example from Prague. Again, this kind of concrete constructions uh, that were uh, examples uh, that uh, where you show the naked truth, so to see, without any covering or cladding. Uh, Gideon, in his book, uses very many similar examples uh, from France, of course, since the topic of the book is about new French architecture. And a very, I think, quite funny uh, example for, for this discourse on the truth of architecture is the speaking building material that can best explain its own identity. And this is the uh, a quote from Louis Kahn when he, tell, he lets the brick telling him how he wants to be laid. I quote Kwan, when you are dealing or designing in brick, you must ask brick what it wants or what it can do. And if you ask brick what it wants, it will say, well, I like an arch. And then you say, but arches are difficult to make. They cost more money. I think you can use concrete across your opening equally well. But the brick says, Oh, I know, I know you are right, but you know, if you ask me what I like, I like an arch. So again, you see here, you know, this kind of, of, uh, of, of speaking, building materials that the architects don't want to, you know, don't want to say, it is my decision to use this or that form, but says, it is the material itself, you know, that wants to express its, its own identity through the architectural work. And it was, again, I make a big jump here, uh, because it, the issue of elasticity was something that, that, started, to, uh, that started to disturb uh, this issue of material truth. What is the real uh, identity of concrete? Of course, that was a question what different architects are answered differently. Already Semper, in his uh, Der Stiel, was dealing with caoutchouc, a new material that was, that was uh, uh, first introduced at that time. And, and caoutchouc uh, for Semper was something that he could very well, you know, place into his system of the four elements. But many other architects, much later even, in the 19, 1930s, 1940s, were still, you know, thinking about the impossibility of working with, with materials like plaster, that are materials indecent. The German, the, the Hamburg architect, uh, uh, Fritz Schumacher, uh, was, uh, was speaking about plas uh, plaster as an immoral architecture because it has no resistance against, you know, uh, capricious ideas, uh, unlike brick, of course. And uh, the probably lesser known architect, Hans Wippert, expressed his doubts about easily shaped materials when he spoke in the 1952 Darmstadt Symposium. Uh, he wrote, he, he said, uh, the world of materials has been expanded infinitely. When our understanding of the truth to materials was based on the characteristics of iron and wood, then these materials offered very specific characteristics which we learned to deal with. Now, however, we are confronted by materials that no longer have this sort of character. These new materials are submissive to us in a way that we have never known before. There are plastic materials that simply no longer say, I am like this and you, designer, manufacturer, must see how you can deal with me. These new materials say, please give me a little this or a touch of that and I will do what you want. Our task is to confidently master materials in a way that we have never done before, and this is a task on a scale for which we feel completely unprepared. So the problem was that he cannot pretend anymore that it is the material that, that, guides, that guides his hand. But with these new materials, you know, you, the, the, the possibilities are, are wide open and we cannot speak anymore about a certain material identity. 
It was, it was recognized quite, uh, in the, at least at the latest, in the 1990s, uh, when, for instance, the already mentioned architect, Christian Sumi, started to build in a way to show uh, that uh, the dogma of the truth to materials is, is, uh, is, is wrong. He wrote uh, in a special issue of, of Daedalus, uh, probably you are not familiar anymore with this, at that time in the 1990s, very important architecture journal. Uh, he wrote that uh, new architects like Bruno uh, Reichlin pulled the entire prudish modernist machinery of legitimation from the moralizing swamp of the so-called truth to materials. As a, as, as a result of this, uh, one could have an entirely different posture regarding modernism and constructional transposition. So, so to say, to, to refute uh, this whole truth to materials dogma, he started to build in a sense that uh, uh, he used uh, an array of different, uh, uh, of different materials, wood, iron, and, but he treated them that they all look the same. For instance, here on the facade of this extension to the Zürichberg Hotel in, in, in Zurich. Or uh, here, an exhibition pavilion, Onoma, uh, which is made of wood, but it is treated to look like metal. So it is a, a kind of a play, if you want, uh, uh, to, to give uh, a, certain, uh, a certain look to a material that is totally different uh, from how we normally know them. Let's put it simply that way. Or Jigong uh, another Swiss office uh, for the Swiss Museum of Transportation in, uh, in Lucerne. Uh, they were using this kind of uh, traffic shields, partly real ones, but partly in order you know, to, uh, to make the children guess which are the good ones and which are wrong. He was, he was also introducing some false one that doesn't uh, exist in reality. Again, you can ask questions about this kind of materiality. What is exactly this? Is this a kind of a metal facade, or is it a more kind of an immaterial facade that is not built of, of, of metal, but built of science? So it is about more uh, the lettering, the, the, the arrows, and so on, uh, that first attract your attention, and not so much the, 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 the metallic effect of the surface. And this is also the name of the game in this case. Two houses by the architects uh, uh, Beart and De Plazes in, in, in the Grisons, in Graubünden. Uh, the Moily house on the left-hand side in flash is uh, a, a five-sided building in, in volume with uh, uh, using uh, uh, 50 centimeter thick walls of very, very uh, light concrete insulating concrete, uh, so it, it, the house seems like the material transformation of uh, the Willemann Lötcher house built earlier in Sefjain, which was designed by the same office. But even in this case, it is a strange effect that it is built of, uh, of uh, it is a very complex round plan in the interior, but it is like, you know, it is like the uh, case of an instrument and plank uh, with this kind of wooden plank uh, that the owner could nail on, on the facade. But on the other hand, you ask yourself, is it a concrete house? Because we are already familiar with the image, you know, of the imprint of the, of the concrete form on the surface of the house. So you see here, and, uh, and the architect himself was referring to uh, I quote, a Semperian metamorphosis is per perhaps detectable in the way the traces of the wooden formwork have been retained, thereby integrating the monolith more with the nearby farm buildings. And I think when we speak about uh, material transformation and alchemy, we have to, we have to mention, or I have to mention, uh, Zumthor and his Bruder Klaus Field Chapel in, in Wachendorf, in the Eiffel, that was built in, 19, in, in uh, 2007, as a result of a material transformation, indeed, very literally. First, a ten-shaped, that you see here, a ten-shaped uh, 
a primitive hut of spruce trunks were created, and this was then uh, shrouded in a tower-like shell of rammed concrete poured in 50 centimeter layers. A fire was then allowed to to burn inside, uh, uh, and uh, and, uh, for three weeks, uh, during which the tea trunks turned to charcoal. And as they removed, they left behind this grooved black surface. The openings required for firing the formwork were filled with glass plugs that you also see on, on the picture, uh, while rainwater enters through the oculus, collecting on the floor. And the floor itself is covered by zinc, uh, produced by the melting and pouring of old metal cans. The small wheel of the inside hole represents Bruder Klaus, Switzerland's patron saint, the mystic Nicolas of Fleur, uh, whose visions are interpreted by the Swiss school of psychoanalysis, Carl Jung, uh, as alchemic symbols. Zutor himself noted, with time, the design became clear and elemental, light and shadow, water and fire, matter and transcendence, below the earth, above, above the free sky. And in terms of, of textile, uh, he referred uh, to his renovation and extension of the Gugalon House, a 17th century farmhouse in the mountains of, of, uh, of the Grisons, uh, as knitting on, knitting on like, you know, continuing the knitting of an old pullover, let's say, uh, which was, of course, uh, the opposite of the usual uh, of the usual uh, paradigm of, uh, of the building protection, you know, the contrast between the old and the new. Uh, for for Zumthor, it was like weaving. You could use the existing supporting threads of a fabric and then continue knitting on. This is uh, the surviving part of the building, of course, facing the valley, and this is the new part. So knitting on, uh, this, this part was the key, so to see, to the new solution. How to continue with this kind of plank-like, uh, horizontal wooden structure that connects the old and the new part. And speaking of textile, again, Gramatio and Kohler, uh, who used robots uh, to, uh, to make prefabricated concrete, prefabricated uh, masonry elements out of brick uh, that were inserted into concrete uh, brick, uh, into a concrete grid. So this is Beat and De Plates again, a winery building in, in, in the Grisons, at the infill between the framed elements, uh, which is a kind of a, a prefabricated, as I mentioned, brick structure that has this lightness in the interior. And if you want a more examples of, of that, the Novartis campus uh, by Roger Dina, Helmut Federle, and Carol Wiederin. It has a facade like a weightless, colorful uh, veil that blurs the constructional logic of the building. Since the sheeting glass plates are transparent, the overall effect is impressionistic, like a painting by, let's say, Seurat, particularly at night. Helmut Federle, uh, the Austrian artist who designed the facade, studied the textile-like compositions of Josef Albers, and like Albers, geometrical patterns of pre-Columbian pottery and, and woven textile. So if I mention the, the Alberses, the Bauhaus artists who then moved to the United States, I think I, I have to mention them since uh, there, is, there is a growing interest again for the work of, of, of these artists. Uh, the Tate Gallery in London just had a very nice exhibition on, uh, on Annie Albers, the wife of Josef Albers, who was a textile artist from the, originally from the Bauhaus uh, workshop. And they went, uh, they taught at the uh, Black Mountain College, a very famous school for the American avant-garde, and they uh, frequently traveled to Mexico, to Mitla. Uh, to collect pottery, but first of all, textiles, to take photographs of the, 
uh, of the uh, uh, pre-Columbian monuments and, and make proposals for, 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 uh, for big surfaces, for instance, that were realized for, for Harvard University and other schools in the United States. This is now, I'm, I'm coming to an end, how we try to, to, to work along those lines. In this spring, uh, I, I was part of a, of a seminar that was called uh, Weaving, Scripting, Writing. Uh, the Alberses were very important for us, and the students started first uh, visiting textile manufacturers and, and, and very simple you know, weaving devices in some garden and around. So on the very first days, they started to make their own textiles that were, I must say, uh, very beautiful, and, uh, and also to, to work. It is not their work in this case, but they are. The, this is by, by Annie Albers, and this is by the artist Laurie Anderson, who was making cuttings from two newspapers, the New York Times and the China Times, and weaving the two uh, together. And this is using a typewriter and creating a, a textile art surface. So then uh, the, same, uh, the same students and, and, and teachers from the studio of, of, of uh, Tom Emerson, but Emerson himself was not part of it, but more uh, Guillaume Botten and Gerard that I was working with, they designed a, a building for archaeologists and kids, as they called it, in Peru. This is a kind of an intermediary site uh, to, uh, to, to, pre to uh, to preserve uh, the, the found fragments here, that people, kids, also would visit them before moving them into a museum. And this is then how the whole building was woven together you know, by, by elements. So it is extremely light and, 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 uh, and indeed uh, uh, the, uh, the result of a, of a kind of a huge uh, weaving stool. And probably the, the final images to show that doesn't mean, mean of course, that uh, uh, it is now a textile and the architecture of cladding that is uh, uh, kind of winning uh, this whole debate. Just in the neighborhood that I live in Zurich, uh, this building was realized. It is a finished building uh, and uh, reminds me very much of this Bilderbaum and for Philip Scherer that you are already familiar with. But the roughness of the overall effect is certainly something that the architects were looking for. The concrete, very much in the sense of, of, of Macri's examples, and also the, the way you know how it is built. I'm not sure that the architects would, Führermann uh, und Hechler, would use the term trust to materials, but they are certainly working with, uh, with the same kind of aesthetics, the roughness, the if you want, the dirty realism of, 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 the, of the previous uh, uh, examples. So this is my, my final image, uh, a painting by Sandro Botticelli, the calumny of Apelles, which is a kind of a legend. When uh, first uh, the, the daughter of Zeus, Aletheia, the goddess of truth, uh, it was, she was modeled first uh, by, uh, by Prometheus out of clay. But uh, at the same time, uh, Doles, uh, the figure of deceit, made a similar figure that looked exactly like the figure of truth, but he didn't have enough clay to finish it, uh, so it had no feet. And then... Uh, Prometheus himself, you know, wondered about this and, and wanted them to come alive. And both came alive, but uh, Aletheia, the goddess of truth, Nuda Veritas, could freely move, but the other, other having no feet, was kind of staying on ground. So what I wanted to show probably with this example that uh, uh, the nakedness of truth became after it kind of a metaphor for architecture. It is certainly looking from or contemporary position. 
we can certainly not defend the, uh, the, uh, the paradigm of, of, uh, of nuda veritas, that it is the naked construction that has to do with truth and pleading is untruth. It is much more this kind of interplay that I wanted to show between uh, masking and unmasking, between wailing and unveiling, that bring us probably closer, uh, if, if not to truth, but to, to understand something about architecture's work. While theorists, historians, and, and curators strive to address the question of materiality and the interface between uh, sensory, physical presence, and meaning, it is once again architecture that succeeds with great precision and poetry to shed light on these kind of circulatory ecologies between work and material, between culture and society. Thank you very much. I thank you very much for really interesting lecture. And uh, we have still some time for, for questions and discussions, so don't hesitate to, to ask. Možná je také čestý, kdo by se netroufal, pokusím se přeložit, ale pan profesor Švácha, my kolik Švácha will have the start. Undoubtedly no um, famous essay by Kenneth Frampton, Minimal Moralia, Minimal Moralia uh, about contemporary Swiss architecture. And there is a very interesting differentiation between ontical architecture of Peder uh, Zuntor, the ontical materiality in architecture, and scenographical architecture of uh, uh, Herzog and, uh, and Demeron or Burkhalter uh, and Sumi. What, what's your opinion on this difference? Thank you for this, for this question. And, and, and uh, I think it is, it is an important question because uh, I had, I, well, put it shortly, I, I disagree with, 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 with Frampton's position there. And I think that I, I could even exchange with him at a certain point when, uh, when he, uh, he gave a lecture and, uh, and uh, made his well-known critical point that today in this kind of uh, media society, it is everything about theatricality, it is everything about uh, scenography and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, 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 and that is somehow endangers uh, the uh, architecture. And unfortunately, he was even mentioning Gottfried Zemper as one of his key witnesses in this. And on the other hand, uh, of course, at that time, Semper was not really translated except a few writings into English. So uh, his, uh, I think, uh, on this basis, he argued that, uh, that uh, Semper would be Again, something that shows that theatricality in architecture is, is, uh, is false, to put it for that. And in reality, Semper was you know, writing about the theater as the, as the most important uh, uh, kind of uh, parallel for architecture, because it's about exactly this kind of transformation. He said that uh, an event, an everyday event, somebody dies on the street or whatever, uh, we, we know it, but it doesn't really touch us. But if, it's, if it, it is turned into art, if it is performed on the theater stage, then this singular event uh, strikes us as something very important. So it is exactly this issue with the material transformation. It, it, this kind of, uh, the first example, a scaffolding or whatever, is a kind of a banal built object. But if it's transformed, if, uh, if the wood becomes stone and so on, then suddenly, because of this transformation that has also a scenographic element to it, this transformation, it becomes important and it can commemorate human culture. 
So it, it kind of enters this whole process of memory, culture, and so on. So I think this is this would be my point that 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 uh, that in this I I really. Uh, like uh, not only as person, but I, I think uh, Framper is a very important thinker. But in this very issue, he was uh, he was not right. Jana Ticha. Thank you. Um, well, my question will touch on a similar theme, although it's not based on uh, that Frampton's distinction. Um, all the time you were talking, I was thinking about the truth uh, to material, that in that sense that there might be two kinds of truth, or better truth of material, a kind of tectonic truth and a kind of psychological truth. Sorry, sorry. Psychological, psychological truth. Um, and now I think today with all those claddings, material claddings everywhere, um, it seems that this psychological materiality is very important, that people need to feel the material to experience it. And um, I wonder if you would perhaps agree with such distinction or uh, what are your perhaps if you have some thoughts to that theme perhaps it's something like materiality literal and phenomenal i'm not sure about that but i think there might be something of the sort <laughs> yes uh, probably uh, just a, a short <laughs> reference to uh, uh, to Karl Bertischer, who was a very important theoretician of of tectonics, and for him, uh, each and every form had two aspects. Uh, on one hand, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the the performative the performative form that was the pure structural form, and and then the necessity that probably you refer to when speaking of the psychological form that that makes uh, that makes this uh, form of necessity uh, readable, understandable. To, to fix it to our sensorium, because otherwise we, we, we couldn't really interpret, we couldn't understand a structure if, if it wouldn't have this kind of aspect. Now, uh, I think that there was an, a, a very interesting kind of simplification of this theory, because for Berti here, uh, these two parts were really aspects, but not two, but, but it was not about you know, a, a core form and, and the cladding out of it. Because when it was interpreted as something like that, then everybody, you know, every modern architect wanted, why not remove, you know, why not remove this cladding and have the core form? But in this original theory, I just repeat it very quickly, it was not something that, that was materially, you know, separate, but it was, it was two aspects of the same form. One uh, that, that performed, and, and the necessity to, uh, to make some adjustments. It's not necessarily you know, a cladding, but make some fine optical adjustments to this form, like in the case of the, uh, the uh, well-known you know, Greek columns, the entasis and so on, make some fine adjustments in order you know, to, to, to make this form appealing uh, to, to our eyes. To, to, to understand how it works, you know, like if you were a kind of an elastic, an elastic mass. So in the case of the enthesis, it is not a, a surplus layer on a, on a cylinder, but it is a, it is a kind of a reworking of the, of the whole element. Another question, please? Uh, may I have also one question? Yes. <laughs> Uh, you two concerning the materiality of architecture. Um, and I, I think that uh, you have touched it, this, the, the question at the end of your book. Uh, we live in a strange time when uh, the, the flows of uh, information are more important than flows of materials and people, when uh, uh, virtual space is uh, something we, we live in, and sometimes we don't know what is uh, real and what is virtual. I was not sure. <laughs> <laughs> also, when you were showing the pictures, what, what was um, uh, virtual, or what was really built uh, uh, architecture. 
Do you think that uh, the architecture and the specialist uh, material aspect can, s can play a new role in this situation to make us more, according to me, to make us more sure what is real and what is not? Because I don't like this uncertainty. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, I, th I think that uh, uh, the, the thing is, you know, I'm just you know, also kind of cooperating sometimes with grammatical with architects who, 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 who do what is possible. So he, they don't think a lot about you know, theories of materiality, but, but, they, but they are thinking about what is possible with the new means. And, and, this, uh, and the, the realms really expanding. So almost everything can be done now with digital technologies and so on. And it seems that, uh, that to think about what we have achieved is a little bit logging behind. And uh, so I was recently in, in many conferences when, when young architects from South Korea, United States, and so on, were showing you know, how, how with 3D printers and so on, they can produce buildings inside that look very interesting. So it is, they look new and, 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 and they had this kind of, 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 of uh, dirty material into it that is exciting, uh, but they are, uh, it is very, difficult for them, not difficult for them, but they, they are uh, just moving very much forward with the technologies and, and probably they don't have the time to reflect what, what they have achieved. So I think what, is, what makes uh, uh, these theories interesting, but because Semper was also you know, have dealing with, 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 with new materials that were unknown before, and he created a system where, that, 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 that opened place even for, for, for uh, for new development, so they could, uh, in a sense, interpret uh, what what they have on hand. So that is missing today. Of course, I know that that today uh, systems are somehow uh, uh, of, uh, out of question. So it is it is not a kind of closed system that 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 uh, we want to see, we want to have, but but more kind of different possibilities, inroads, uh, and uh, and uh, I think. Material is something that, that uh, on one hand, uh, is becoming wild, so it is, it is really everywhere, in every form and every shape, and, uh, and the reflection about it is, is, is missing. So uh, I'm not saying that, that I'm kind of providing a, a, a guidebook in order to understand uh, new materials and experiments, but certainly, you know, among those lines, it would be very important to uh, to, to develop uh, ways uh, to, uh, to understand what we are doing, really, because that is, that is very often missing. Please, can I ask a question? Uh, so I think I must, I want to thank, thank once again to, to you all. I think I found also a little <laughs> bit long, I apologize for that. No, 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 no. I thank also to you that you have come and, oh. Good, good night. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Kicsit hosszú lett, még belefér. Na hát, örülök neki. Jössz utána te is? Sajnos nem. Azért nem, mert a problémám van, hogy jobb Na hát, Herbert, ki a feleségem is úgy, együtt jöttünk, de ő is megfázott most hirtelen, és ő is azt mondta, hogy inkább otthon marad is, ki Herbert. Uh, én, én nekem érdekes dolog történt. A Miroslav Sik, aki tanított. Persze, persze. Most így tanít. Tudom azt is. Nálatok? A... Nem, 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 akadémia. Akadémia. És a feleségem tanít velem. Ő kettevező, és akkor ő úgy gondolt, hogy, hogy most az a teológia, hogy nem a fontosak, hanem az, ami körülöttem. 
Hát tulajdonképpen igaza van, igaza van, és hát nagyon sokan, ugye, a, 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 beleértve, hogy még olyanok is, hogy ilyen ikonikus épületet terveztek, mint kórház, és most megpróbáljuk mondani, hogy fontosabb az, hogy a meglevő, a meglevőbe lépítsünk, nem a helyet, hogy, hogy új objektumokat tegyünk bele. Úgyhogy azt hiszem, hogy, hogy ez a fajta gondolkodásnak tényleg van jelenleg fontossága. <gül> Pláne hát egy olyan városban, mint Prága, ugye, ahol már alig van hely igazán újnak, hát legalábbis ami a belvárost illeti, mert különben ebben a sprawlban még biztosan lesz sok lehetőséget meg vele illeszteni meg jó gondolatokat, de itt bent pedig, pedig tényleg sokszor meglevő struktúrákkal kell, kell csinálni valamit. Na hát arra nagyon kíváncsi lennék egyszer majd, egyszer majd, jó, jó, hogyha majd legközelebb itt vagyok, akkor azt, azt elmondottam, mm-hmm. hogy úgy itt történt. Okay. És hát gratulálok a, a munkáidhoz, mert az meg fantasztikus, hogy milyen szépek és ah. Nem, komolyan, komolyan mondom, komolyan mondom.